Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to another media briefing. We're just going to let folks come on into this virtual space and get settled on the Zoom screen. We are all Zoom experts, I know. <laughs> I'm Rose Zacharias, president at the Ontario Medical Association. We're just going to let people file in, and, uh, and as the Zoom room gets a bit more full, we'll make some introductory remarks. But thank you very much for coming today and for making the time. So we are going to welcome everyone. It is uh, it's good to gather uh, once again around uh, our latest media briefing on important healthcare issues in the news. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'm Dr. Rose Zacharias, president at the Ontario Medical Association, which represents more than 43,000 physicians in Ontario. Ontario's healthcare system is struggling to meet the demands as we continue to experience the triple threat of the COVID-19 virus, also the flu and RSV. We could be facing a difficult holiday season as cases of these respiratory viruses continue to rise. As of December 3rd, we know that 24 local public health units in Ontario we're reporting influenza activity. And, and that compares to this time last, uh, well, in 2018, prior to the pandemic, that number was only two public health units reporting influenza activity, and now we're at 24. Seniors are being hit hard by this year's flu. RSV is still circulating among children, and hundreds of cases of COVID-19 are still being diagnosed every day in Ontario. Today, we're gathering at this media briefing uh, and to talk about what can be done to ease the pressure at both the patient and the system level, to help clear the pandemic backlog of care while also keeping patients healthy and out of emergency departments, family doctors in Ontario are working more days than they did before the pandemic. A new OMA analysis shows physicians in team-based practices are providing care 235 days a year, up, to, uh, up from 221 days in a year before the pandemic. That's about a 7% increase, uh, which means that doctors are working more weekends, more holidays, and, um, and some of their days off. This is despite doctor shortages, burnout, and the large number of patients returning to the healthcare system even sicker um, because of the backlog of care. But we know that more than 1 million people in Ontario do not have a family doctor. To address the doctor shortage, the OMA is calling on the government to quickly license more foreign trained physicians who are here now in Canada wanting to work as doctors. We have proposed the creation of practice ready assessment programs to rapidly assess physicians who have completed their training and practice abroad uh, over a 12 week period of supervision and direct observation. With government funding, such a program could be implemented immediately with new doctors in the system by next spring, including in underserved areas. In the meantime, there are other ways that patients can access medical care. Health Connect Ontario has a, a symptom checker and the option to chat live with a nurse. Patients can also call 811 to speak with a nurse 24 hours a day. There are physical walk-in clinics or virtual clinics that also provide in-person care if needed. A list can be found uh, of those clinics at Health Connect Ontario. Pharmacists can suggest over-the-counter treatments or renew prescriptions on a short-term basis. There are also COVID cold and flu care clinics. Anyone can visit this kind of clinic if they have COVID or influenza-like symptoms, but they're primarily intended for people who don't have a family doctor. A list of locations uh, of those clinics can be found on Ontario.ca. The OMA will put those links into our if patients have an urgent or life-threatening condition, they absolutely should go to the emergency department. This is and always has been appropriate. 
There are also things that um, patients can do uh, to help uh, family doctors by giving them as much information before the appointment as possible. For example, when booking an appointment, it's good to let your doctor know what uh, it is that you're calling to book the appointment for, um, so that on that back end, family doctors can allocate the right amount of time, um, have a, a conversation, uh, their office staff with you as uh, to determine if this is going to be a phone visit, a virtual visit, maybe by video, or an in-person visit. Um, and also renewing your prescriptions um, uh, in a batch uh, as opposed to one at a time is a practical way. If your prescriptions are all up for renewal at the same time, that's also something good to bring to your doctor's attention and to come to appointments with the list of your medications, um, which will allow you to engage and make that appointment really using um, both um, your and your doctor's time as valuably as possible. I would now like to introduce our panel of experts who will talk about improving patient access to care in more detail. First of all, uh, Dr. Tara Kieran, welcome. Dr. Kieran is a family physician at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto and an associate professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Secondly, we have Dr. Sohal Goyle, who is the medical director of a COVID cold and flu care clinic in Mississauga and is the OMA district chair for Peel Region. Welcome, Dr. Goyle. Also, Dr. Rod Lim is the medical director of um, the pediatric emergency department at the Children's Hospital in, uh, in London at the London Health Sciences Center. Welcome, Dr. Lim. So to turn things over to our panelists, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Kieran um, to start us off. Dr. Kieran, how is the family doctor shortage uh, affecting, affecting healthcare? Thanks so much, Rose. Um, so I think we're, we're all hearing stories of uh, how busy it is in healthcare, and it's absolutely true. Um, of course, we've got, as uh, Rose talked about, um, surging rates of viruses more than we would expect for this season. And on top of that, a health system that um, uh, is unfortunately short on doctors um, with more doctors stopping work and uh, leaving practice and, and far fewer coming into specialties like family medicine than we need. Um, but when you hear all of that in the news, I think uh, it's easy to think, uh, oh, I'm sick, but I'm not important. Uh, this is not important enough for me to go bug my doctor. But I want you, 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 people to understand that, of course, as doctors, as family doctors, we're here for you. And we're seeing patients and working hard. And um, if you have an issue, we want to be able to address it. Um, having said that, many the good news with many of these viruses is that uh, for many people, they will be able to manage the viruses at home on their own. Um, we do get very, we do get worried more about people who are very young or very old or have weak immune systems. But for the vast majority of people, um, even those in those um, in those buckets I mentioned, they they will be able to recover at home, um, and the virus will get better um, without the need for any kind of uh, prescription or medical treatment. Um, um, but there are some times where you do need to be seen by a physician um, to be assessed. Um, you know, you should be going to the emergency department, for example, if you have a child who's under three months and has a fever. Um, if a child has difficulty breathing, if the child has signs of dehydration, those are reasons to go to the emergency department. Um, similarly, for adults, often, you know, they can get chest pain or shortness of breath. Um, again, chest pain, shortness of breath. Uh, um, not being able, getting confused, and uh, are, are all kind of reasons to seek more emergent care. Um, now, many people won't be that sick, but they'll be a little bit sick, and uh, you may need to actually see a family doctor. Um, so when might that be? So for example, you have a child and you've been trying to manage their fever at home for a few days, but it's been more than four days now that would be a good time to call your family doctor and have them assessed. Um, or perhaps they have an earache that's lasting more than two days, a severe sore throat, um, they're, uh, or a child who's irritable and fussy even after you've given them some, some um, fever medication, or they're not drinking. Um, we know sick children who are sick often don't eat, but when they're not drinking, um, we get worried about dehydration. 
So those are all reasons why you might be able, you want to visit a family doctor. We would want to examine you. We want to take a look in the ears and the throat um, and listen to the chest and uh, ensure that a child, for example, is not um, getting dehydrated. Um, you would also want to seek care if you're, you know, um, an older age, if you're 60 or older, if you're immunocompromised, if you haven't had actually um, your COVID vaccines, or if it's been actually more than a year since you've had a COVID vaccine uh, and, and you're 60 years or older. Um, one of the things that, you know, is, is tricky is that we can't actually often tell just from symptoms, well, we can't tell just from symptoms, whether someone has a flu virus or a COVID virus. And we do know that for um, some people, especially for, for COVID, they, they, there are medications that we can provide for people who are, who are older or immunocompromised. Um, those medications actually can be um, provided at a pharmacy now, but they can also be provided at those um, assessment centers that um, uh, uh, Dr. Zacharias mentioned early in the, in the briefing. If you're not sure where to go, because I've presented already a lot of information that might be um, tricky for folks, um, as Rose mentioned, you should definitely uh, contact Health Connect Ontario where you can speak with that live nurse. Um, we want you to stay safe this winter. And what does that mean? That means um, prevention is better than treatment. So get your COVID vaccine, get your flu vaccine. Um, and, and this is especially important actually for young children and those who are, who are older again. Um, wear a mask in indoor crowded settings stay home when you're sick um, and wash your hands. So these, we need to just go back to the basics and ensure that we're doing those things to keep ourselves safe. Um, lastly, I do wanna acknowledge, I know it's really frustrating for those of you who don't actually have a family doctor right now. And uh, we know that our at current estimates, even before, well, I should say estimates before the pandemic were that 1.8 million people in Ontario didn't have a family doctor. And we know that that problem is only getting worse with um, doctors having left practice uh, in, in higher degrees during the pandemic. And many doctors, um, you know, now burning out, um, sometimes facing illness themselves due to the pandemic. So uh, if you don't have a family doctor, there are still ways for you to get care. Um, Health Connect Ontario is a really good starting point. As uh, Dr. Zacharias mentioned, there are also uh, walk-in clinics that you can attend and urgent care clinics. Um, but it is important to seek care if you are not feeling well in the ways that I described earlier. Uh, and our system does need to do more to ensure that all of you do have access to a family doctor. And uh, we're advocating for things like um, ensuring, for example, that every family doctor in Ontario has access to working with a team uh, to allow them to actually see more patients. So those are the kinds of very tangible solutions many of us are trying to put forward to say if, if we had those solutions, um, hopefully we could do something to actually um, ease the burden of people who don't have a family doctor right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kieran. I uh, really appreciate uh, all of that very practical advice. Now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Goyle, uh, the medical director of a COVID cold and flu care clinic in Mississauga, the first of its kind really in Ontario. Dr. Goyle, what do centers uh, like yours offer? Could you describe that to us, please? And um, where can patients find information on such clinics in their area? And who should be seeking treatment there? Dr. Goyle. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zacharias. Um, as mentioned, we were one of the first uh, COVID cold and flu care clinics in Ontario. Uh, COVID cold and flu care clinics are community-based medical clinics that can test, assess, and treat patients with respiratory illnesses such as COVID-19 and influenza. This clinic model started last year, and as mentioned, the model has been replicated across the province. Currently, in our region, in central region, there are 25 clinics and 101 across the province that provide testing, assessments, and treatments to patients in the community. These clinics are staffed by physicians, nurses, and other team members and treat children as well as adults. Patients should visit a COVID cold and flu care clinic if they do not have a primary care provider and their symptoms or their child's symptoms are getting worse or not improving. In addition, some patients to a COVID cold and flu care clinic by their physician or other healthcare provider. 
Finally, any patient that is symptomatic and at high risk of getting very sick from COVID-19, as mentioned earlier, and qualifies for COVID-19 testing and treatment should consider visiting one of these clinics. Appointments can be made the same day or next day at these clinics, and they've been successful in decreasing emergency room visits. Since these clinics have started, would have gone to our emergency if they had not been seen at a COVID cold and flu care clinic. As a physician working and leading the clinic, it's very satisfying to be providing this type of service to the community, knowing that we are not only treating vulnerable patients with acute respiratory illness, but effectively diverting some of the volume from our local hospitals. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to describe these clinics and certainly be happy to answer more questions as we move forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Goyle. And I apologize. I think we're having a bit of technical difficulty with uh, Dr. Goyle, just a couple of glitches there in the answers. I think we'll have it cleaned up um, by the time we get to the Q&A. Thank you so much for that information. Also, we'd like to move on to uh, Dr. Rod Lim. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Rod Lim. You, of course, bring us the Pediatrics Emergency Department perspective. And so I'd like to uh, just have you open up and, and tell us, um, when should you go to an emergency department and what can you expect there? Um, how is the triple threat, the COVID, RSV, influenza viruses that are still circulating, impacting children specifically? Thank you so much, Dr. Them. Thank you very much, Dr. Zacharias. Um, currently, emergency departments uh, and the healthcare system in general are still experiencing extreme stress, and we've had unprecedented wait times, volumes, and acuity uh, that has been persistent for almost three months. Uh, three months now, all hospitals with pediatric patients are currently experiencing occupancy at 100 percent, and at the tertiary pediatric hospital level the volumes are in excess of 118%. Amongst children right now, we're seeing influenza A as the predominant virus. Uh, this is causing higher acuity uh, due to a lot of the complications related to influenza. This is stressing our inpatient and ICU capacity, and I think hospitals are working better than ever uh, trying to transfer and to increase capacity for children in this province. COVID and RSV continue to circulate as well, and the uh, tridemic, unfortunately, uh, is continuing. We do anticipate a rise in adult cases over the next two to three weeks, which usually follows the, the peak in pediatric patients. And unfortunately, that would align perfectly with the holiday season. We really encourage everyone to get vaccinated ahead of the holidays, where we'll see a lot of intergenerational mixing, which could put your elderly and vulnerable loved ones at risk. There have been so many innovative approaches to expand capacity, uh, and at the heart of that, I really want to highlight the dedicated workforce that continues to work under extremely difficult circumstances, and to them, I give my thanks for an incredibly difficult job at this time. In terms of what people can expect going to the emergency department, we ask for their patients. We, we know that you understand that patients are going to be seen in the order of their acute presentation. Uh, that may mean that people are going to be waiting different times depending on the reason for their presentation and also the care spaces that are available to see patients. At the heart of it are a group of individuals that want to provide excellent care uh, and are doing the best they can to, to minimize the waits and to, and to ensure that you get the care that you deserve. Families should do their best, and we really appreciate that they do, to explore all options available them, to them before going to the ED, like uh, reaching out to your primary care provider, calling Healthcare Connect Ontario, that, that's been discussed. But if it is an emergency or you do not have access of care, uh, the emergency departments will be there for you. Um, signs, obviously, such as difficulty breathing, any neurologic signs, uh, concerns about dehydration, fever in a vulnerable population, like under three months of age, uncontrolled bleeding, severe pain. All these, uh, of course, need to be addressed in, in an emergency care setting, and we do not want families to, to not seek care uh, uh, because of the news that they hear. In the end, we do not want any harm to come from people being afraid to, to utilize emergency services. Um, I'm happy to answer questions as, as we move on, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to have spoken. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Lim. I do know that uh, all the questions are coming in uh, to the, the chat. And so we do intend now to turn our attention over to them. Thank you to all of our panelists. You represent such uh, lived experience and expertise in each of your fields. And so we do want to now field the questions. So Emily English from the Ontario Medical Association will be moderating the questions. You can continue to put them in the chat. I know we have quite a list already. If we don't get to your questions uh, due to time, uh, the media team will follow up with you for sure. You can also email media at oma.org with additional requests for interviews. And we are going to provide a recording of this session available later this afternoon for you to listen to. So now I will turn it over to Emily. Thank you very much. And thank you to all our panelists uh, for participating today. Uh, the first question is for you, Dr. Goyle. Can you tell us more about when a patient should seek treatment for a respiratory virus? Yeah, th thank you for that question. Um, it really depends on the circumstances as mentioned uh, by Dr. Uh, Kieran um, as well. Um, so that individual, if they are considered high risk. So for example, if they're an immunocompromised patient or a patient with multiple comorbidities um, or a young child, um, depending on the symptomatology, um, need to be seen earlier than let's say uh, someone who's at lower risk um, certainly can be managed at home with mild symptoms. If those symptoms uh, remain persistent, um, or are moderately um, more, then that's when they should seek care. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate that answer. Um, the next question uh, is from a reporter, Karen Howlett. Um, this question I'll direct to uh, OMA president, uh, Dr. Rose Zacharias. Uh, is the OMA concerned that Ontario appears to be increasingly losing Canadian doctors who are educated abroad to other countries? Uh, Dr. Zacharias, could you speak to that? So we are extremely concerned about the doctor shortage uh, here in Ontario, across Canada. We uh, know that um, even prior to the pandemic, um, we could have used more medical student spots, residency training spots, and, and yet coming through the pandemic, the increased level of burnout, the early retirements that we're seeing, and, um, and more focused areas of care as opposed to the broad-based uh, comprehensive family medical profession being chosen, uh, we are extremely concerned about the doctor shortage. And so it's why we have prioritized it as one of our immediate solutions. It's why we took this to Queen's Park as a group of physicians just a few weeks ago to meet with MPPs, to be there in the legislature, to, to know that this is an immediate solution that we need to implement. And we are recommending practice ready assessments to bring those internationally trained physicians that are here uh, to stay here and those barriers to be reduced in order for them to gain a license and to be supported in entering their practice. And in the long term, seeing more medical student spots and residency training spots so that we can build a more robust doctor workforce is absolutely a priority. But we know that even this immediate solution, if it was implemented, could see hundreds of doctors into our system as early as the spring. So we're working with our regulator as well as uh, all levels of government to, uh, to, to bring forward and recommend strongly this solution. Thank you very much. And the next question is from City News Toronto. Uh, this one is for Dr. Rod Lim. Um, Dr. Lim, how long do you anticipate the tridemic will last and when might there be relief? <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, we certainly do not anticipate that we're going to be out of the woods uh, from a pediatric uh, and emergency setting until uh, late March. Uh, that's just a complete guess on our part, judging from the from the past experience with different flu seasons and different strains, uh, and some of the talk around uh, uh, potential uh, COVID uh, strain uh, uh, coming in the next few months. So again. It's very hard to know, but for sure the winter season is always a difficult time. Uh, so we anticipate uh, heavy pressures for the next few months. 
Um, and a, an important consideration that I do want to mention is, is that this is a common occurrence, not to this degree, but, but the winter time is always a difficult time for emergency services, especially in pediatrics. Uh, and any talk about future right sizing of, of pediatric capacity would be welcome because after we're done the, the, this tridemic, uh, we have future years to consider as well. Thank you very much. And we have a question from Tyler Griffin with the Canadian Press. Uh, Dr. Zacharias, I'll have you comment on this. A number of virtual walk back services as a result of recent changes to virtual billing fees uh, that kicked in at the start of this month um, due to the new physician services agreement. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, could this lead to patients uh, overcrowding emergency departments where they would be exposed to respiratory illnesses um, or have long wait times? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? It's important to understand the context of virtual care. Prior to the pandemic, it nearly didn't exist. Less than 5% of visits were happening virtually between patients and their doctors. And yet doctors were forced to pivot. And when we were following the public health guidelines and there was restrictions about gathering and sheltering in place, doctors were calling their patients and connecting virtually uh, over the various platforms. And so we came to leverage, I think, uh, the crisis that COVID presented as far as virtual care at that point being necessary and now understanding that in many instances it is a wonderful addition to how a patient and physician can connect especially when it comes to prescription renewals or uh, reviewing uh, lab results um, mental health consultations can happen very effectively uh, virtually and we know that the very best care between a patient and a doctor is inside of an ongoing patient-doctor relationship. And so at this time, our virtual care framework um, allows for exactly that. And, uh, and so virtual care is here, it's here to stay, and we see it as a very helpful uh, modality um, for patients to connect with their doctors. Um, and we know that the best care is inside that patient relationship. Of course, we have the challenges that we mentioned that we don't have enough doctors. And so that's why we're recommending the, the, the implementation of those solutions. Um, but just getting back a bit to, uh, to some data that um, we really ground um, our understanding in, a study funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research did compare people who'd visited their family doctor virtually with people who visited a virtual only walk-in clinic. And the study found that the virtual walk-in patients were twice as likely to have an emergency department within visit within 30 days. And so we want when people to connect with doctors for there to be an ability when the patient presents that if they need to be seen and examined, that that would be able to happen. Because otherwise, a patient is left in a very difficult situation when they've already interacted with a physician virtually and then are unable to complete that assessment, to follow up that assessment, because there's no opportunity for that physician to see the patient. So this is the model of care that we know is best, and it is the model of care that we, we stand behind. And so here we are at this point in uh, December 2022 um, with virtual care implemented into our care strategy in that way. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Tara Kieran, um, I know you've done some work in this area. So um, can we please get your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so I was, I was actually the senior uh, author on the study that Rose mentioned, so I just wanted to make sure that we were able to, to cite that, because I think um, there are limits to virtual care, and in particular, there are limits to virtual only walk-in clinic care, um, and it's that kind of care that I think is not necessarily providing our system with the best use of resources. Um, certainly, um, in my opening remarks, I gave many examples of when it is that you need to seek um, care. Uh, and in all of those cases, you need to be examined by someone. Uh, someone needs to look in your ears, in your throat, uh, listen to your chest, um, understand uh, if there is something else that's going on or something that's requiring treatment. And that really can only happen in person. Um, um, I think Ro uh, Rose also mentioned at the beginning 
that you know if, if you're not clear on, on where to go, you can call um, Health Connect Ontario and they would do they would do that virtual assessment through through that nurse um, if you so and and they would direct you to say, okay, no, actually you do need to be seen in person. So uh, the virtual, so I just wanted to 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 highlight those points that um, Rose made that you know virtual only walk-in clinics may actually be resulting in more churn, um, more cost to our system. That's what some of the research that we are actually uh, that generated uh, suggest. Thank you very much uh, for that answer. The next question is for Dr. Goyle. This one comes from the Cambridge Times. Can you tell us how concerned we should be about variants right now? Yeah, great question. Um, certainly, um, you know, we're seeing less COVID uh, right now in our clinic, as Dr. Lim mentioned. Um, we're seeing more um, respiratory viral illnesses, including influenza, amongst our pediatric as well as um, our elderly population. And we've cer certainly some of the trends we've seen are pointing towards more um, non-COVID type illnesses. But we have to always be on the lookout. Um, you know, we, we, we don't know. Uh, when the next major variant or if that next var variant uh, will hit. Currently, the, the variants that we're seeing within Ontario are variants from uh, BA5, which is BQ1 and BQ1.1. And we haven't seen the increase in admission um, as well as um, uh, morbidity that goes along with uh, some of the various variants we've seen in the past. So we're hopeful um, that we don't see a new variant, but certainly we have to be um, concerned and continue to monitor for these. Thank you very much, Dr. Goyle. And we have a follow-up question uh, for Dr. Zacharias uh, from Karen Howlett. Uh, she wants to know more about the Practice Ready Assessment Program that the OMA um, has proposed uh, and how the Ontario government has uh, responded so far. Thank you so much. Yes, we do see this as um, a yeah, strong recommendation that we're making practice ready assessments would be um, even over the course of months, as opposed to sometimes half a year or a year to bring physicians into the system and if they were implemented. So we're continuing to work with our regulator, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, to explore exactly what that means. Of course, there are credentials and, uh, you know, a scrutiny uh, under which we would want um, physicians to rise to as they come into the system, uh, the healthcare system in Ontario and start caring for patients. That being said, if there are unnecessary barriers as far as time and, 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 and paperwork um, pushing things along, then we want to expedite those so that we could bring those physicians into the system that are indeed ready uh, to see patients and yet uh, don't have a license at this time. And so we're working with our regulator, working with our provincial government to, uh, to see this through. Thank you very much. And the next question is for Dr. Rod Lim. Dr. Lim, you're the medical director for the Pediatric Emergency Department at the Children's Hospital at London's Health Sciences Centre. So can you tell us how your hospital is dealing with um, the high demands right now? Yeah, it's, it's a very difficult situation. And, and again, I applaud the creativity, uh, the things that we are, have, to, have had to stand up in a very short period of time. Uh, and increased capacity ha have been uh, extraordinary. Uh, we, uh, at this moment, are uh, opening up a, a step-down second ICU unit uh, to increase capacity within our hospital. Uh, we hope to have, uh, uh, to, to have that up and going in the next uh, few days. Uh, we uh, have uh, looked within our organization for anyone with pediatric experience and have uh, had them voluntarily redeploy to, to help with, uh, with our volumes. And we have had to delay uh, uh, specific pediatric surgeries related to uh, that may require an inpatient component uh, after their their uh, their surgery. So there's just been so many uh, so many uh, attempts to increase our capacity to to help meet uh, the needs uh, and a, a lot of incredible people working behind the scenes to to try to make that happen. Um, I do want to highlight uh, this week for, uh, again with the flu watch report uh, from the Canada government. 
uh, that the there is a chart there uh, showing the number of hospitalizations in, in children uh, compared to previous years, and it's uh, it's quite extraordinary to look at. There's over 250 uh, hospitalizations related to influenza and pediatrics across the country, which is far uh, far exceeds any previous uh, uh, um, uh, number. Um, so the demand is is real, and and the hospitals, not just my hospital, but uh, throughout the province, are working extremely hard to to meet that need. Thank you very much. And Dr. Kieran, another question for you. Um, what are things that can be done to ease the burdens that family doctors are facing? Uh, great question. Um, I mean, I think so, you know, to start, obviously, we're, things are busy for a variety of reasons, including, um, of course, uh, the recent viral surge, but also um, a backlog of uh, of care that really came up through the pandemic. So when people um, don't have access to uh, definitive surgical care, for example, um, they don't have access to diagnostics, um, uh, to the specialist appointment, they uh, end up being managed by us um, as family doctors. And uh, in addition, we have a backlog of chronic condition and pre preventive care um, that we're we're trying to to catch up on um, because the, many of those things were deferred um, often for good reason during the pandemic. Um, on top of that, all people are continuing to struggle with mental health and addictions, which always makes up a really large part of our practice. So when it comes to easing the burden, um, um, right now there are about thirty percent of family doctors. Uh, in Ontario uh, are able to practice in an interprofessional model. So that means you can practice together with nurses, nurse practitioners, social workers, dietitians, pharmacists. I'm very lucky to be one of those um, uh, family doctors who gets to work with a team. And uh, I will say that it allows me to provide a certain level of care to my patients, um, uh, more joy in work, um, but it also allows me to increase my own capacity to see more patients. Uh, and uh, because it means that I can ask folks like my, my pharmacist or nurse or social worker to follow up with patients instead of me having to do that. And uh, it would go a long way in our province if we were able to expand teams so that every family doctor had access to uh, working with interprofessional teams to support their patients um, with the goal of trying to enhance capacity. I think the other areas that we need to do better include, um, for example, trying to reduce administrative workload and burden. Um, there are some things that uh, we simply uh, shouldn't need to happen. Um, we shouldn't have to write a sick note for patients uh, to be able to get time off work and go back to work. Um, that should be, uh, you know, between the the um, person who's ill and their employer. And so we need to, to, to end that practice. And that would, for example, be one very small thing that would actually have a, a quite a large impact. But there are many examples of, of how we can try to reduce administrative workload. Um, and then we also need to improve um, our digital connection. So improve um, you know, the, the information systems that we're working with. Uh, we shouldn't have to duplicate entry things and we should be able to get the records that we need uh, and communicate with patients in a more efficient way. Um, so, uh, and then the last thing I'd say is uh, we need more streamlined ways of actually accessing um, care. Um, often, you know, right now with uh, backlogs, we're often having to make three or four different referrals before we get someone to be able to accept a patient um, or um, be able to have a patient get a test in a timely way. Um, ideally, we have more centralized uh, options where we're able to put in um, a referral and uh, uh, that referral then is looked at and the closest, fastest placed is found uh, for the patient um, and that doesn't fall back on the doctor to do. So those are just some examples of how we can try and reduce the work burden that does fall to family doctors um, that shouldn't need to. Thank you very much. And the next question is from Tina Yazdani, who's with City News Toronto. Uh, Dr. Zacharias, um, this is for you, another follow-up on uh, licensing um, foreign trained doctors. Uh, what barriers are in place? What have you heard from the government? How likely is it that it will happen by the spring? 
So we have been speaking with government because we do know that there are other provinces that um, have been implementing such uh, programs, and we know that that has been an effective means of having more physicians in the system. We also... Um, we see the alignment around the recognition of the, the lack of family doctors, the lack of doctors in general in the system. And yet we, um, we are looking for more uh, commitment to an action plan. And so we continue to uh, work with the regulator to, um, to bring this forward as a very implementable solution. And, uh, and we, are, we are waiting and continue to be committed to seeing this plan through. Uh, I think if it was acted upon, we could have several hundred physicians in the system by the spring and, um, and, and time will tell um, the commitment to our recommendation and seeing it through. But I look to my physician peers and to many of our hardworking, resilient, high capacity doctors that are committed to good patient care. But this is a gap that we are all feeling when emergency department physicians show up and usually there's five docs that cover a 24 hour shift and it's an area I know well, and only four doctors are there to cover that 24 hour period, you feel the strain. And yet you are medically legally responsible and have a deep conviction to deliver good care. We need more doctors in our system. This is a very practical way to do that. And, uh, and we are urging governments to act on our recommendation. Thank you very much. Um, and the next question is for Dr. Goyle. Um, Dr. Goyle, what trends are you seeing now in your COVID cold and flu care clinic? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, over the last number of weeks, as mentioned uh, by Dr. Lim as well, we've seen a pediatric surge um, at these clinics. Um, so a large number of pediatric patients uh, presenting with uh, influenza or COVID-like symptoms. Um, but that has started to settle down a little bit over the past week. We are seeing, um, again, um, some of our older patients now presenting with some of these symptoms which is again, similar to the trend uh, that Dr. Lim uh, was describing that we're seeing throughout the healthcare system. And certainly, you know, what we've seen throughout this past uh, year that we've been open is that things can suddenly change. Um, and, you know, this is based on today's information. Um, certainly we are concerned um, over the holidays of everyone getting uh, together and, uh, you know, in indoor spaces and spreading some of the viral illnesses to each other um, in, you know, through in intergenerational uh, type environment and thus, um, uh, you know, increasing the number of patients who are ill um, with these different symptoms as mentioned by Dr. Lin. Thank you very much. And uh, the next question is for Dr. Lim. Uh, this one comes from Mike Crawley, who's a senior reporter with CBC News. Uh, Dr. Lim, you mentioned the impact of influenza on child hospitalizations. When there were six deaths linked to the flu among children in BC, officials there made numbers public and encouraged vaccination. But here in Ontario, the Ministry of Health officials have not been willing to report how many children have died with the flu. Should Ontario be making these numbers public? Why or why not? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, and there are a lot of factors to just to be fair in terms of uh, accuracy of reporting and, and timelines. As we know, uh, according to Flu Watch Canada, which was reporting back to the to, up to December third, uh, officially there are five uh, pediatric influenza deaths across the country. But we know from reporting from British Columbia that that they, uh, with advanced numbers, uh, feel that that they have a more accurate number of what's going on uh, in in their situation. I find it hard to believe that the with the numbers of, of hospitalizations that we're seeing that across the country, the trends that are being reported out of British Columbia, I'm sure are going to be mirrored across the across the, the country, including Ontario. Um, I think uh, if the numbers are accurate and reliable, that kind of information can help inform the public and can be useful to encourage uh, people to to uh, to seek and, and listen to public health uh, um, uh, advice. 
Um, so um, I, I, I think we know that this is an extremely difficult influenza se uh, season across Canada. The numbers will come out. Uh, I, I can't uh, comment as to the timing, um, but I think the most important thing for people to take away is for us all to take our responsibility and, and this seriously and to listen to public health. Thank you very much. And the next question is uh, for Dr. Zacharias. This one comes from the Cambridge Times. Would you be able to comment on whether privatization of healthcare or a combination of public and privatized health uh, healthcare could help the current healthcare crisis? And if so, what might this look like? So as Ontario's doctors, we are committed to a publicly funded system and our prescription for Ontario, which is our most extensively consulted um, document and action plan of recommendations um, is the is the most extensively consulted in, in NOMA's 140 year history. And so it's actually not just the doctor's plan, this plan for a more robust publicly funded system comes from uh, all external healthcare stakeholders, from members of the public, um, from our healthcare colleagues um, that we work alongside every day. And so we believe that committing to investments around what our prescription outlines, um, which is strengthening primary care and catching up on the surgical backlog and uh, an investment strategy around mental health and addictions and, and uh, community long-term home care, palliative care, these are possible inside of our publicly funded system so that equity and access can be assured for our patients, that no one jumps the queue or pays out of their back pocket to jump forward for a surgery that they've been waiting for, that people are, are triaged according to their need and that everybody gets the care they deserve. This is a, a, a deep conviction. Uh, and uh, as physicians and as a doctor that's been in the system for 22 years, very proud actually of working in an emergency department and knowing that everyone who shows up at the door will get the very same exact care. And so I stand behind it, uh, proud of Ontario's doctors uh, that we stand behind it with an evidence-based strategy to make it so. Um, thank you. And we have another question for Dr. Zacharias. This one comes from um, Mike Crawley with CBC News. Uh, what, if anything, could the provincial government do right now to ease the strain on hospitals? Our hospitals are under enormous strain. Um, we see that because um, uh, beds are at a premium. We know that emergency departments emergency departments are are um, occupied with patients who are admitted and are unable to access beds inside the system. And so we know that an investment in, in home care and palliative care would move those patients out. I think it's alignment um, that we see with um, our hospitals and putting forward our prescription for Ontario and urging government to act on our recommendations is, is what we are, um, are glad to be on the same page about. And so um, moving forward um, with our, our hospital partners and, uh, and, our, and the physicians in Ontario, um, we um, together even call on uh, our federal government to increase the Canada Health Transfer, which would um, increase the amount of um, dollars that are spent inside our healthcare system. And, uh, and so these are ways that um, we look to even into the new year uh, to see some announcements being made and some improvements um, being implemented. Thank you very much. Um, and another question for Dr. Rodlin. This one is from Alan Hale with Queen's Park Today. Uh, do you agree with Health Minister Sylvia Jones' insistence that things are under control at children's hospitals and that they were prepared for the tridemic? Well, I'll, I'll echo Dr. Zacharias' comments that hospitals are under extreme pressure, and I've never seen people work harder and be more creative and innovative uh, during this incredibly difficult time. Um, I would like to point out that I think what we have learned from this is that we need to have a, an honest conversation about capacity. Uh, and capacity in times of surges, which in pediatric hospitals always occur in the winter season. I think uh, hopefully we've all learned that running hospitals at or near 100% capacity limits the ability for us to 
to respond to anticipated or unanticipated surges uh, in a in a in a timely and orderly fashion. I think the other thing that I would really like to bring up is that the the system right now has really responded. I'm so proud to, from all layers, either from primary care, from the community pediatricians to to community hospitals to tertiary care hospitals to really respond to this, this overwhelming challenge that we're facing right now. This degree of coordination, I think, has never been seen before, and I hope that we take from this a lot of those lessons uh, to move forward. But at the heart of that are people that are working exceedingly hard, long hours, for a prolonged period of time now. And I think we also need to have an honest discussion about how do we support healthcare workers, uh, not just now, but into the future. Uh, and I think that that is by far the most important thing. And I hope that we can all look back at this and not let this, uh, once this hopefully eases, not just let this uh, go into our rear view mirror, but have some honest conversations moving forward. Thank you very much. And the next question is for Dr. Kieran. Um, Dr. Kieran, can you tell us, has the pandemic made the family doctor shortage worse? Unfortunately, it, it certainly has. So um, even prior to the pandemic, um, 1.8 million people in Ontario didn't have a family doctor, a regular family doctor. And some of the research we've done showed that um, in the first six months of the pandemic, uh, twice as many family doctors stopped working as would have been expected uh, based on trends from the previous decade. And then we've also done research, uh, survey-based research uh, back in 2021, asking people about their future practice intentions um, uh, from among family doctors in the Toronto area. And we um, found that unfortunately, 17% or almost one in five family doctors in the Toronto area um, were thinking of closing their practice in the next five years. So really worrying. Um, what are the reasons for this? They're multifactorial, but um, from the data, we see that many of the people who are thinking of closing practice are, in fact, um, older physicians. They're um, maybe six, over 65, over 70. Uh, they're often male. Um, they're often uh, operating a solo practice, um, so not working with other, other doctors. We know those types of practices, um, running your own business, um, running them by yourself has become, was even more challenging during the pandemic. And we know that many older doctors, you know, uh, were probably heading towards retirement anyway, but this pandemic probably nudged them um, for a number of reasons, including their own personal health concerns. Um, uh, at the same time, um, you know, we, we, we have uh, fewer people choosing family medicine as a career out of medical school um, and fewer people who train in family medicine choosing to practice uh, in office-based practice. And again, I think some of that also does relate to the pandemic because, um, uh, you know, we have a cohort of graduates who uh, unfortunately trained during a time where things were, um, uh, the learning was difficult and not all of them are coming out of that learning feeling comfortable and confident going into family practice um, given its complexity. And I think many people are now seeing how hard it is in family practice as well and sometimes choosing different paths. So there's lots that we need to do across the system to address these issues, but those are just some of the factors that have come out during the pandemic affecting the doctor shortage. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Goyle. Dr. Goyle, do you expect cases of respiratory viruses to rise after the holiday season? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yes, uh, we are anticipating um, that respiratory illnesses will rise after the holiday season. And that's due to the reasons um, that we had mentioned a bit earlier in that um, as we get together and gather during the holiday season with our, our, our friends and family in indoor spaces, um, there's more chance for these viruses to spread from one another. So we encourage um, all of you to consider, um, again, uh, updating your vaccines, um, your COVID-19 vaccines, especially for our, our most vulnerable patients, um, ensuring that uh, every Ontarian has, uh, ha gets a flu shot to again, uh, decrease the likelihood of spreading that influenza virus to each other, as well as um, doing our best to wear masks in indoor spaces as much as possible and washing our hands. These simple measures will hopefully have an impact to decrease the, incre to decrease the number of patients that we expect to present uh, with uh, viral illnesses post uh, holiday season. 
Thank you. And the next question is for Dr. Zacharias. It's from Alan Hale with Queens Park Today. Um, are you frustrated by the lack of public health information being relayed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the government lately? Is it contributing uh, to the problems? We appreciate the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the government's uh, efforts to provide accurate and uh, timely information. Um, there has been a lot thrown at us in the pandemic, and it's important that we act on information as it comes forward. And so we do appreciate um, the efforts that we have seen on behalf of government, as well as our chief medical officer of health, providing us information. Thank you. And Dr. Kieran, another question for you. Uh, can you give some tips for patients who don't have access to a family doctor? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, so I think uh, lots of, uh, so a few different thoughts. So one, um, register with Healthcare Connect. Um, this is the official kind of way in which Ontario is trying to support people to get a family doctor. Having said that, I recognize that in some communities, um, I've had patients myself who've, who've, who've moved away from my practice and have tried and been told it's a 10 year waiting list. So I recognize that that only goes so far, but I, I think they have been able to help some people in some communities. So give it a try. I also always recommend um, looking to see if there is a, a medical school um, in your area where family doctors are being trained um, because uh, uh, often fam family training clinics, family medicine training clinics are accepting new patients. And uh, being a patient of a resident physician actually uh, is wonderful because you get two doctors often for the price of one, both a resident and a staff physician. Um, of course, um, the, the resource that was put, put out um, right at the start uh, uh, of this call by Dr. Zacharias, um, Health Connect Ontario is a terrific one. So if you don't have a family doctor, they actually can um, obviously direct you as to where you should go for care, whether you do need to actually see a walk-in clinic doctor, for example, or go to the emergency department. But importantly, sometimes something that I think people don't uh, necessarily realize is that they can also help with certain aspects of preventive care. So for example, um, I believe they can arrange for you to get a, a fecal immunical chemical test, which is the screening test for colorectal cancer. So if you're 50 and over and you know you're due for uh, 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 colorectal cancer screening, but you don't have a family doctor, you can access it through um, Health Connect Ontario. Um, they could probably facilitate you, uh, help you to understand um, you know, how you could self-refer for a mammogram if you're women over 50 and need a screening test. So they're a wonderful resource beyond actually even just um, an acute care or a, a, an urgent issue. Um, lastly, I do think that, um, you know, uh, often we are going to Google, uh, Dr. Google, but it is really important to um, go to trusted websites. Um, one website I often refer my patients to, uh, it is a U.S.-based website, but I refer patients to the Mayo Clinic's website where they do have a lot of really um, good information about different kinds of conditions and their management. Um, and as Dr. Zacharias mentioned at the beginning, when it comes to uh, feeling uh, when, uh, symptoms of um, viral symptoms in this current season, uh, there's the symptom checker um, and uh, some really good information uh, on the uh, Ministry of Health website that I, I believe will be put into the chat as well. Thank you very much. And thank you to all our panelists uh, for participating today and all the media who attended and asked questions. I'm gonna pass it over to OMA uh, President, Dr. Rose Zacharias, who has some closing remarks. Thank you, Emily. And yes, thank you so much to our, our panelists, Drs. Kieran, Goyle, and Lim uh, for bringing us your insights and, and expertise. And, uh, and, and thank you so much for attending today's media briefing and for your thoughtful questions. I, I think we may not have got to every single question before our hour was up. And so once again, uh, to remind you that you can email media at oma.org. Uh, the media team will follow up with any uh, questions that weren't answered. You can make requests for media interviews and we will follow up with those as well. And uh, we hope the information shared today um, 
was really helpful, especially this time of year. And, uh, and just to remind uh, everyone of getting their flu shot and their COVID-19 boosters and, um, and, and to head into these next weeks as prepared as we can possibly be. Thank you everyone for your time today. Bye.